Uh, next week, our guest speaker for this class is going to be Tori Meidel. Tori is the co-owner and founder of Dream Acre Flower Farm in Manti, Utah. So it's, it's gonna be really interesting. I'm looking forward to learning more about her. She's growing and selling her own flowers. So especially for um, anyone in the audience that is interested in that, and you thought that would be so fun to have a little flower shop or something, that's what she's gonna talk about. Okay, um, today it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Ben Bowie. Ben has an extensive background in web development. He's written code for companies large, like Reebok, Sherwin-Williams, Centura Health, and small, like Defend Your Money and Film Fest Media. He's currently building Boink Web Development. Did I say it right? Boink, okay, I was gonna check with you before, make sure I'm getting the right pronunciation. Yep, nice job. Boink Web Development, where he helps unleash the internet in a transparent way for small to medium-sized businesses with superior quality code. Check out boink.com for more info. That's B-U-I-N-K.com. Not only does he write code, Ben also manages um, DevOps, leads teams, oversees design, and does just about everything you expect from a CTO. You guys know what a CTO is? Who knows what, a, who can tell me what a CTO is? Someone knows. Well, okay, I'll let Ben, t you can, I don't know, give extra credit or something. <laughs> they know what a CTO is. Um, he calls himself a fractional CTO because his skills are perfect for businesses who realize the importance of an experienced technical lead, but don't have the budget for someone full time. In his free time, Ben runs an e-commerce site and YouTube channel called MyNiceTie.com. And I, I feel a little embarrassed I'm not wearing a tie today. He has taught millions of people how to tie a tie and helped microfinance 841 entrepreneurs in 77 countries. This is really cool and he's gonna talk a little bit more about that. He's, he currently seeks to use the symbol of a necktie to make the world a better place with My Nice Ties Last Hope Project. Ben tries to give back to his community. As a student at CU in Colorado, he ran the Graduate Entrepreneurs Association and startup CU. Shortly after graduating, Ben co-founded Spark Boulder, the first space for startups at CU. Later, he served for three years as a scoutmaster for the Boy Scouts of America. On a more personal note, he's married with four energetic boys. He's a player of guitar, a devourer of cookies, an artist who is starving for time to practice, a supporter of freedom and liberty, a fluent speaker of Russian, an, and a follower of Christ. And he makes some mean roles. So please welcome Ben Bowie. Can you guys hear me out of this mic? Yeah, okay. Camera. How about now? Hello, hello. Testing. All right, great. Um, so entrepreneurship is one of the things that I've, I'm passionate about. I've been excited about entrepreneurship since I was a kid, and I'm excited to share that passion with you, hopefully motivate some of you to uh, choose this as a career path, or maybe just be more entrepreneurial inside a bigger company. But most, most of the things I'm going to talk about today are on this list. I'm going to walk through my background and show how these principles of entrepreneurship helped me in my career. So first, eye for opportunity. Super important. You need to be able to see an idea, see an opportunity as an entrepreneur. You need to be action-oriented. You need to be persistent and team-focused. Those are things that I'm going to talk about with my background. Uh, and then I'm not going to talk much about growing and sizable market, but that's also important as well. So I started thinking about entrepreneurship as a young child. I grew up in, uh, my mom was a single mom, 
and we didn't have a lot growing up, so if I wanted something, I had to learn to work for it. And as a kid, I collected cans. We, uh, I saw the opportunity to collect cans to get five cents, I think, per can when I would recycle it. I lived near a golf course, so I would uh, jump into the canal and find golf balls that golfers had lost. I think that's illegal, actually. I, didn't, I wasn't too concerned about the law at that time. Um, but uh, I don't even know if, if you can do that anymore. And I, I found opportunities to sell trinkets. I was just, really, I wanted this uh, Nintendo game. It was Duck Hunt. And if you guys have never played that game, it was one of the classics. I hate to date myself a little bit. But that was, that was my goal at the time. I had the goal to get, to get Duck Hunt. And so I found different opportunities to do that, and looking for opportunities has become kind of a, a skill that I've optimized over the years. I keep a list, so if you can see closely, if you can squint your eyes a little bit, you may be able to steal some of my secrets here, uh, quote unquote secrets, but I've been keeping a list of business ideas for 15, 20 years, and it's useful sometimes when I'm like, oh, I got a little extra time on my hands. Maybe I'll look and see if any of the ideas I've had in the past would be interesting to do now. It's also fun to see some of those ideas eventually become a reality. It's kind of cool that you had an idea that someone else had the exact same idea and then they actually made money off of it. That's kind of cool. Um, and it's also fun to look back at ideas that you're like, wow, what was I thinking? That was like the worst idea in the world, but it's all part of this uh, skill, which is to see opportunities. So how many of you here are interested in being an entrepreneur in your career? Raise your hand. It's okay if, if you're not. So it looks like a, a lot of you are. And how many of you started as a young child looking for opportunities? Of those that raise your hand, how many started young? Okay, so not many. And I. I want to emphasize that it doesn't matter. You can start at any time looking for opportunities and honing that skill uh, because that skill is going to benefit you wherever you go in your career. Um, and I don't want you to feel like, oh, well, everybody we hear at this lecture series started when they were young. Hopefully that's not been the case. But if it is, I, I want to encourage you to not feel like that's a blocker for you. Uh, some of my other learnings from keeping track of my ideas is the American dream is alive and well. Um, and not just in America now, there's opportunity all over the earth, uh, all over the world. In fact, there's a lot of opportunities, more, sometimes more opportunities outside of the U.S. than there are now in the U.S. Um, the other thing I want to mention is ideas are not valuable. Ideas are a dime a dozen, sometimes People have the same idea, like I mentioned, in different parts of the world. Um, now, if you disagree with this, feel free to come up. We can chat after. There are rare instances when an idea can have value. But for the most part, the idea is not the most important factor for success. You have to have an idea, and then you have to put energy into that idea. You have to do something with that idea. Without that, the idea is worthless. And then you also, some other tips. Um, you need to find a team that you can work with, and we'll talk more about that uh, with my story. So the last thing I want to mention here is a little bit more about ideas. The best ideas, they satisfy a pain or a need in the marketplace. They uh, are, need to be in a growing market, or at least a sizable market. You have to like the industry as a whole. So you. One thing that I didn't understand as an entrepreneur at your age was that whatever you dedicate your life to, whatever idea you try to pursue, you're going to be, your head is going to be in that space for a long time, probably five to 10 years. So you need to choose an industry that excites you. If you like cars, choose the car industry. If you like uh, shoes, you could go into, the, into textiles or shoe, the shoe industry. And then last, you need to choose an idea that's related to your strengths. So you, you can't, it doesn't matter how good your idea is. It, let's say you're a mechanical engineer major. It doesn't matter how good your idea is in lipstick. 
you're probably not going to be well suited for that unless maybe you change your major and start going in that direction. So, so I want to tell you the story of my first big idea. I was a missionary in Russia and for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that was a great time. Well, Russia has this law where they don't want to let you stay in the country to renew your visas. I'm sure a lot of you know what a visa is, but in case any of you don't, it's basically where a country says you can come and live and work in that country even though you're not a citizen. So what Russia would do is they would kick us out every three to six months, and we got to go to Korea. So as a missionary, that was great because we got to kind of have a vacation. We didn't speak the language. All we could do was go uh, worship in the temple. And, and one day, uh, one, one of the days we were there, one of my missionary companions knew this place kind of far away from where we were in Seoul, Korea, called Dongdae Moon. And it was basically like a giant mall, except like, 30 times bigger than a mall. It was like multiple buildings, miles and miles of products to sell, sunglasses, shoes, hats. And my missionary companion knew right where to go because we were on the hunt for some neckties. We wore neckties every day, and it was nice to have the best neckties. And he knew, he knew the spot. So we walked probably about two miles through just rows and rows of these little shops selling everything you could think of, and we found the necktie area of the city. And there were just walls and walls of the most beautiful neckties I'd ever seen. So we asked how much they were, and I had no idea the exchange rate, and, and the person said, well, 2,000 won. I was like, wow, that sounds expensive, but these are, these are beautiful. So. We had to do some calculations. Turns out that was $2 a tie. And at that point, my ability to see opportunity was like broken. It was like, whoa, I, uh, neckties are selling for like 20 bucks in the US, and we can buy them here for two bucks. So needless to say, I filled my suitcase with neckties uh, that day. And when I got back from my mission two years later, I met a friend who was also interested in business, and I convinced him to invest $7,000 in a business where I would go to North Korea, I would buy 2,000 of the brightest, most beautiful ties I had ever seen, and I would come back, and even if I sold them for a couple bucks, I could make a great profit. I knew a little bit about profit margin, and so I was, I was on the warpath. Anyways, somehow, through great luck, I was able to get those neckties, 2,000 of them, back to the US. I had no idea what a tariff was, a quota is. <laughs> like, I had no idea of how to import and export. Um, it was sheer providence that I was able to get those neckties back to the US. Um, and I started selling them door to door. And that was exciting some days when I would make more than my wife did in an entire week in one day. And it was really difficult other days when I couldn't sell a necktie to save my life. At the time, I was selling them for $10 a piece. And I quickly found out that no one would buy $10 neckties. It was the weirdest thing. I thought for sure I could sell them for a discount and people would buy them. But I found out really quickly that people only buy $20 neckties. They don't buy $10 neckties. So there's, there's a lesson there. When you think about what you're going to price your product at, you have to make sure to price it correctly. And sometimes a low price is the wrong price. So what did I learn? I learned a lot of good things. But first, I want to do an object lesson with you. I have a gift card. For 20 bucks, this is a credit gift card. You could take uh, a girl out for, on a date, or you could uh, go with some friends to a nice restaurant. I'm, I have this for the person that wants it the most in the room. So who wants this? Couple hands. 
I'm going to give it to the person that wants it the most. So, I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> the loudest. The loudest. That's a great guess. Like, there is some way I know. I, I have a way of knowing who wants this the most. And loudest is a good guess. Uh, who else wants it? I want it. You want it? Yeah. Nice. Well, how, how do I know that you want it the most? Because I'm up here willing to take it. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. He wins. What was your name? Colin. Colin, nice job. Give me a high five. So, what did we learn from that? I didn't know how long that would take. Have you seen that object lesson before? No, but I just figured I might as well try it. So. <laughs> That's exactly the lesson I wanted uh, to have happen because the idea here is that entre the most important thing in entrepreneurship is doing something, action, getting up, reaching out, grabbing that opportunity. And so thank you, Colton, for teaching us that great lesson. I already talked about how price signals value. Um, doing something is better than thinking about it. But one thing I didn't, once you're willing to do something, once you're willing to stick your neck out there a little bit, you really need a plan. And that's one of the mistakes I made with this first business. I didn't have a strategy other than there's an opportunity here and I wanted to capitalize on it, but I didn't have a really good strategy. So, Moving on, I, about that time, I attended a lecture series, not unlike this, as in fact, it was exactly like this at BYU, and I was thinking about strategy a lot. And also at the time, there was a company called Tom's Shoes. Have you guys heard of Tom's Shoes? So it's a company where, if you haven't heard, they, every pair of shoes they sell, they'll give one away in a third world country. And so I was thinking, well, you know, what could I do with neckties? Maybe I could, if somebody buys a necktie, I could give it to someone in a third world country. I was like, no, they're, they're going to need a lot more than a necktie. And one day at this lecture series, a guy came in and talked about a snow cone business where he would take some of the profits from his snow cone business and he would lend them to people in third world countries at 0% interest. And I thought that was a really good idea. I liked it because the Tom Shoe model actually has some negative side effects to it. For instance, if you go and give a bunch of shoes away in a city, what happens to all the shoemakers? Well, they go out of business. But if you are able to help somebody by giving them a 0% interest loan that they pay back, well, that can do a lot more good. And so I really liked that idea. And it actually changed my life. So these lecture series can change your life. Uh, so thank you for being here today, because it I don't know if I'll change your life, but I, I bet one of them will. Anyways, as I was trying to think about my strategy, my customers kept asking me for a website. It was early on in the internet days, and not many people had websites. But I saw that as a great opportunity. And one day I was in a big lots and there was a box on the shelf and it, it said, build your own website. And it was discounted 90%. So obviously these were great sellers. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was only 10 bucks. And I remember it was like the, the answer I had been looking for, the strategy, part of my business strategy. So I grabbed the box and I run over to my wife and I say, honey, I have to buy this. Now, we were poor college students at the time. We were married, and we were uh, already expecting a child. So money was very tight. And she was like, no, we are not spending $10 on a build-your-own website box. And I guess I kind of understood, because she was a technical recruiter, so she was recruiting people for $100,000 jobs to build websites. And here's this box on the shelf for 10 bucks that promises to build a website. I mean, it, it was a little bit questionable, I guess you could say. But I knew there was an opportunity there. And I, sometimes you have to be a little persistent in entrepreneurship. Everyone around you is going to tell you no. And you just have to trust your gut, trust the opportunity you see, and go after it. So I bought that box. And I'm so 
grateful to Russ for inviting me here today because I, in researching what I was going to say today, I found the first website that I ever built, which I've been, look, I've been trying to figure out this. There's a thing online called the Wayback Machine. You can go and look at what a website looked like many years ago. So this is actually what my first website looked like. You can see the design is quite good. Um, the layout, obviously I had a knack for layout, putting the most important thing right in the middle. Uh, no, no lines or really design savvy at all. But um, I quickly found out the, another great lesson from entrepreneurship, which is if you build it, they do not come. I know you've seen that heartfelt movie where they build the what baseball field and then everybody just comes because they built it. That is not how it works in real life. You can set up the best website you think you, ha you can and no traffic will come. But surprisingly, I actually sold a couple ties. So um, I was pretty excited about that. And it did something really weird to me. It made email very addicting because when you get an email and it's like, somebody just gave you 20 bucks, it's, it makes email very addicting. And to this day, I'm addicted to email. Um, but I quickly realized I needed to get traffic. And I was doing all kinds of stuff, like trading traffic with other companies and uh, paying for traffic back in the early days when you know, it was, there was a lot more kind of shady stuff with traffic going on. And then I came up with the idea to make a how-to video. It was even before YouTube was huge. It was 2000, late 2007. And there were a lot of different YouTubes. YouTube wasn't the only video hosting company. It's still not, but um, there, we, no one knew what was going to win. So I made this video. I talked my wife into giving me 100 bucks to buy a video editing kit. And uh, I put up the green, this green screen in my closet. I didn't even know any other knots except the one that I taught. It was the only necktie knot I knew. And I didn't even know the name until I made this video. Uh, so back to the principle of just doing something. It took me two weeks. And I actually started getting a little bit of traffic. In the first month, I had 1,000 views. And that kind of blew my mind. But my whole goal was to get traffic to the website. So I would go and look at my analytics, and there was none. No one was coming to the website. And I had spent 100 bucks and two weeks to make this video. And after a month, it was a failure. So I was like, well, I got other things to focus on. I'll focus on making the website bigger. Uh, and doing other stuff. No traffic. Well, I'm not going to do that again. So I logged in nine months later, and my mind was like, whoa, what has been happening? I hit 100,000 views in nine months. Now, what I didn't realize at the time is this is a crazy good trend. <laughs> if you are in an industry and you see a trend like this, you double down, even if it's not making you a dime. But what did I do? I went in and I said, how, many, how much of this is converted into traffic? And none of it was. So now I'm nine months into this experiment. And I'm like, I'm never making another video again in my life. Um, I'm still done. And no one was converting at the time I had my first child. And some people wait to have children. Uh, until they have a successful business. I actually think the data supports that if you have more responsibility, you have more motivation to be successful. It becomes not just a side thing. It's like you got mouths to feed. You have to find something that's successful. And it, it, it really does help. So this email changed my life. Talk about being addicted to email. I got an email. What was it? September 9th, 2009. So this is two years into the videos. YouTube sends me an email. Hey, by the way, we're letting you host your video on our platform for free. And it's helping drive traffic to your site. But guess what? We're going to also pay you every month in the advertising revenue that we make off your video. So this was, this was a game changer. I had no idea what, that this would come. 
Um, and now the channel has 52, over 52 million views. Uh, we've sold neckties all over the world. This is a, interesting. The, the head of YouTube Trends wrote a history on YouTube. And he has chapter 10 on how-to videos. And the story of My Nice Tie opens chapter 10 of the history of YouTube. Uh, and this is what I'm most proud about the company that we've, uh, Russ said 800 people we've helped. We're now, we've now helped 913 people all over the world to start businesses and pull themselves out of poverty through this amazing gift that we have of capitalism and, uh, and hard work, entrepreneurship. So what did I learn? Re reoccurring revenue is crazy good. If you can make money while you sleep, you can own an asset and make money. That's one of the best things you want to do. Ownership is key. If you own an asset, you can generate revenue off of that asset. And you always want to pay attention to that. Action, again, is key. Uh, be persistent. This is one thing that a lot of people get wrong. They think, I have this great idea. I'm going to put some, ac I'm going to put some energy into it. And a couple weeks in, they've given up, just like I did. This is a, a mistake that happens all the time. That's not how you should look at entrepreneurship. You should look at it instead as find an interesting industry and then start learning everything you can about that industry because that work will pay off eventually. Everything you learn about the industry, all of your action, even if each individual thing doesn't work out, like my traffic trading and all that, the videos ended up working out very well. Um, trends are more important than they seem. And then I just want to mention a little bit about how to make money on YouTube. This is a big question these days. The most important thing you need to do on YouTube if you're going to start a YouTube channel is tell stories. It's all about stories content, teach something, teach something with the story. That's the most important thing. Some people think, oh, well, I got to get affiliates. That comes next. Once you get an audience and you get people engaging in your content, uh, providing interesting and useful content, then you can make some money with affiliate product placement. If you guys don't know what affiliate marketing is, it's basically where you can take a link. And if people click on the link, Wherever they went to buy something, you get a cut of that sell. So Amazon has affiliate links. By the way, if you do that, you need to let people know that you're getting paid for recommending those products. It, there's FTC guidelines about it. Um, but you can make money with affiliate links, as I did. You can make money with YouTube revenue. And you can also make money doing product placements and advertising directly in your video. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, I'd love to, to chat more with you after this. I continued to learn how to build websites. Uh, that was where my passion was. I knew that that industry had a lot of growth opportunity. Um, and so that's where I focused more than I did on YouTube. I improved my necktie site. I started building sites for other people. and. Uh, I started a company called Blink Web Development. This was after I graduated from BYU. And at this time, I hadn't seen all the success from YouTube yet. And so I didn't have the confidence that I wish I had. And I worked on this business for about three months, and then I gave up. I had mouths to feed, and I didn't want to take too much risk. And so um, I worked on... Blink for a little, or I, I left Blink, took a corporate job uh, as an analyst and a planner at Payless Shoe Source, and I found that I was very technical compared to the other people uh, at the company. I also found that I, can, I do not fit well in corporate America. There's too much status quo. There's too much. Uh, po there's too many politics going on in in the office, and people didn't want to innovate. They weren't as innovative as I wanted to be. And so I, I got back out. I went and got an MBA. And my strategy here was, I've already done a business undergrad. I'll do a, an MBA. It'll be super easy. 
and then I'll launch a startup while I'm at school, which turned out to be really great, right? Because you can get student loans to help you start the business. You can get team members to help you work on the business idea. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I launched this company called Happy Freebie. It's basically like a Groupon for products. At the time, Groupon was kind of early and it was an industry that was trending a little bit. And I had learned my lesson from My Nice Tie, thinking that if you build it, they will come. This time, I tried to like make it super viral. Everything about the company was engagement driven. So you could win stuff, which everybody likes to win stuff. It's pretty easy to want to win something. You could save, so we did discounts, kind of like Groupon. And then we also had the ability to win, to earn points. So as you engage with this stuff, you would earn points that you could then use to buy the, the products. Um, I also launched a, an initiative to uh, find an exclusive group of basically mommy bloggers, is what we called them at the time. And I had 3,000 bloggers apply to be part of this program. And then uh, this was a group of 200, and then this was a smaller, more exclusive group of 15, and uh, it, was in, it was really interesting. That, that was interesting because I kind of made some of, some of the bloggers mad because they had to compete to be in the program, and I found out that there's like, an, there's like a, a hidden underbelly of like mommy blogger mafia. <laughs> if you make them mad, like they'll, they'll, they'll do some crazy stuff. Uh, if anyone is in that industry, let me know. I'd love to swap stories about it. Um, but anyways, the company fell for two reasons. One, it, it was an exciting industry for me because it was products for parents, but it, um, it wasn't a great fit for me in terms of my interests. Like, can you imagine me leading like 300 mommy bloggers? It's like... It wasn't a great cultural fit uh, for me, um, and I couldn't, I couldn't, like, I could have maybe made that work, but the bigger problem was intellectual property. Have you guys, do you know much about intellectual property? Raise your hand if you even have heard that term. So when you work on something, you create what's called intellectual property, and I was working on this with teams at school, and so as, people would work on my idea, they would create intellectual property, and I didn't have the correct legal protections in place to have people work on my business. So once my business started taking off, I went to my team and I said, hey, can you sign these intellectual property right agreements? And one of my team members, for good reason, didn't want to sign it because he wanted to be in that industry as well, and he didn't want to open up a risk for himself. So it cast a kind of a shadow on the company and I ended up deciding not to move forward with it. Um, and so yeah, th that was some of the learnings there. As Russ said, I, at about that time, I saw an opportunity for uh, the first space for student startups at CU. And so I, I learned the lesson about team, how important team was, not doing everything on your own. And we put together a great team of students that designed the space. We ended up raising $15,000 in cash just by pitching this idea. So the idea was good enough and the team was good enough that we were able to pitch it to the community and we found our first sponsor, which was Archer Bay uh, legal firm. They guaranteed our lease and then after that, we other sponsors came on and we were able to raise $15,000 to build out the space, or sorry, $50,000. Um, Let's see, what else about that? The, this space went on to host 50 plus events with 3,000 plus attendees. It helped 200 plus student startup companies find startup jobs, get connected to the local business community. So it, there's no way I could have done all that on my own. Uh, it was a nonprofit and eventually it was absorbed into the university. So the big learning there is team. I went on to work for an agency for a little bit using my web development skills that I had acquired previously. And that's when I started Blink Web Development. That's what I mostly do today. Our goal is to catapult companies to be VC funded 
acquired publicly traded Fortune 500 and household names. So VC, that stands for venture capital, basically help startup companies raise money and become successful. That's, that's our business. And we've had a little bit of success for that. We had one of our clients end up raising VC money and they're still doing very well. They're called Clarivine. And then another company, they were acquired by a larger company. And I have to put quotes around acquired because actually COVID put them out of business. They were in talks to be acquired by a larger company. And the government in San Francisco shut down all businesses like theirs, so they couldn't even operate. Needless to say, the, the deal fell through, and the company acquired them for free, basically, because they took a lot of their employees. Um, so it was really bad timing, but that, that helped us reach our goal. So learnings there, again, action-oriented. My, my experience with neckties led to YouTube, led to a successful YouTube channel, led to improving the world. Neckties led to websites, led, led to Blink. And really my overall goal is to launch a SaaS startup. So that, that's a future uh, thing that I'm gonna be doing. And then uh, Spark Bowler actually led me to be involved in the first space for startups at, in Ephraim, which we're calling Ephraim Workspace right now. Um, and you guys are all welcome to come. It's, it's more targeted at the local business community, but it's, it's a space where you can come and, and work with like-minded people um, the other piece of learning here is with consulting, I was able to get paid to learn the industry. That's a really good place to be in. Um, I knew I wanted to be in tech startups, and so I launched Blink to get the experience that I need for my future goal, which is to launch a successful SaaS startup. Uh, I also learned to focus on the client, and I learned that the world favors the obsessed. If you're willing, this is a quote from Twitter. I think it was Patrick Bet David recently. He's a great entrepreneur. Um, he said, the world favors the obsessed. And I found that to be true. The more you're willing to focus on one aspect of, of an industry and become kind of the world expert in that, the, the closer you're going to be to living your entrepreneurial dream. So I think that's all I wanted to say. How much time do I have? Seven minutes, okay. And where, where is Ethan Workspace? It's, let's see, I don't even know the address. It's down by the um, Dragon Chinese restaurant Dragon? across the street. I think the Boy Scouts of America office used to be there. Um, I'm kind of new in Ephraim, by the way. Can you tell them what a SaaS startup is? Yeah, thank you. Uh, SaaS startup stands for software as a service. So what's a good example? Um, Trello is a software as a service. Any, any software that you pay a monthly fee to, be, to use the software, it's a software as a service. I cannot tell you how lucrative those businesses are. You're selling server time and code. You write this code, you run it a billion times on the server, you scale up the servers for almost pennies, and then people pay you a monthly fee for that. It's crazy how much money those companies generate. Um, but uh, but yeah, so right now it's all about goal. The last thing I want to say is goals. If you don't have goals yet, if you're not converted to setting goals, you have to start today. My goals, I have goals for all my companies. This is one Russ talked about using the symbol of a necktie to improve the world. Uh, this, the necktie is a symbol for success. It's a symbol for uh, traditional values. It's a symbol for um, power. And so we're using that symbol to promote ideas that lead to successful individuals, communities, and nations. For instance, one of those, freedom of speech, we came up with it. We're still working on some of the icons, but the idea is that we choose an icon, we uh, create colors, and then create merchandise around that so you can kind of wear the values that you support. Uh, I have goals with Blink. They're uh, very important. I talked a little bit about that. And then here's Ephraim Workspace and, and other ideas. So. Uh, there's a couple other things, but anyways, that's that's the bulk of what I want to say, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions, if anyone has any. Any questions? I throw too much at you? I go too quick? 
on your YouTube learnings, you're talking about telling stories, and then affiliates come, and then you have YouTube revenue. Can you help the students understand what YouTube revenue actually looks like today? Yeah, so I actually, like you probably saw on that slide, I kind of scribbled out how much money I make on YouTube. It, we actually can't share that exact information, but what I can share is that it's about three bucks a thousand views. So if you create a video and you get a thousand views, you can monetize that for about three bucks. And you have to get your channel to be big enough to where you're getting enough uh, views to where uh, YouTube will let you join their partner program. But, um, but yeah, it, you can get way more than that, and you can, sometimes you get less than that. But on average, it's about $3 per thousand views. So, and that's, that's not what my company makes, but that's what I can say. So, um, yeah, great question. So that doesn't mean once you get to 1,000 views, you're going to make yeah, and I don't even know how big that is. So it's gone through changes over the years. Um, at one time, it was like anybody could monetize. And now they pulled it back, I think, because of all the regulations that the government started putting in where they have to re help report, people report on their taxes. And it just became unbearable. So YouTube pulled it back. I think it's, it's 40,000 a month. Okay, but yeah, it, it, that sounds right. I thought it was the number of views too, but um, but yeah, you could look that up. Any other questions? Yeah, back here. Why do you prefer um, like doing your own thing, starting your own business? So I I have always it's just kind of what I what I prefer, um, but. Sometimes people ask me, they're like, hey, should I go off on my own? And the, the, my thoughts there kind of depend on what you have going on. Because like I showed on the slide, it's great to get paid to learn an industry. Like You can learn everything about an industry at a job and not have to take as much risk. And there's, um, there's another thing that I like to mention related to that, which is that a lot of people don't know this, but the most, some of the most successful entrepreneurs, like statistically, are in their 40s. So start early, get all the experience you can. But um, from what I understand, I'm seeing some looks over here. Maybe I'm wrong with that statistic, but it was my understanding that it, uh, most entrepreneurs are, the most successful entrepreneurs are in their 40s. So yeah, totally, totally a viable option there. But um, I think for me, I, I enjoyed entrepreneurship because of the freedom. Like, I can come do this if I want. I don't have to work. It, there is a little bit more stress in entrepreneurship, but I have a lot more flexibility. Um, I can work on my side projects easier. I can work on new inventions. I have a couple inventions right now that I'm working on with different people. So that's a great question. I saw another hand. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you really like being part of it. What is something that you that might not be a, a big strength for you that you found that working with the team helps compensate for? Everybody, yeah, so, and working as a team did come naturally to me because I was kind of always like, no, I want to, you know, I want to be in control. I, I don't want someone else to make a mistake uh, that could affect my life really poorly. And, um, but, for me personally, like everybody has their strengths and weaknesses uh, and skills and backgrounds. So I have a lot of ideas around like hardware, like making a little internet connected device or you know, how, how many cool things could you do if X device was connected to the internet. So I have a lot of ideas like that, but I have no background in device manufacturing. Um, and I'm actually now working on a, a smart device, but my co-founder is in that industry and has been in the industry for like 40 years. So that's an example. And also there's personality differences, like um, having a diverse thought 
on a team is super important. Different backgrounds, uh, different ways of looking at things um, is, is super important. To, and, and to be able to check your own self, because a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we get stuck in these little tunnels where it's nice to have a voice that we can go to and get feedback from uh, on, a, on our ideas. Other, other questions? I think we may be out of time. Right. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah.